So the word of God that we are receiving today is coming from Numbers chapter 21. Numbers chapter 21, verse 1 to 9. Numbers chapter 21, verse 1 to 9. This is the word of the Lord. When the Canaanite, the king of Arad, who lived in the Negev, heard that Israel was coming by the way of Atharim, he fought against Israel and took some of them captive. And Israel vowed a vow to the Lord and said, If you will indeed give this people into my hand, then I will devote the cities to destruction. And the Lord heeded the voice of Israel and gave over the Canaanites, and they devoted them and their cities to destruction. So the name of the place was called Hormah. From Mount Hor, they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the people became impatient on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we loathe this worthless food. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that many people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten, when he sees it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on pole. And if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. Amen. Let me say a brief word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you yearning to know you, yearning to be exposed to the truth that you are teaching us through this passage. So Lord, may you open us, open our hearts, may you give us insights, wisdom, all that we need in order to understand this passage. May you be present with us through the Holy Spirit that our hearts will be pounding with joy as we read this passage. May you guide us and let this time be glorifying you. In the name of Jesus we pray, amen. Uh, Oh, by the way, uh, just in case some of you are uh, wondering why Pastor Steve is not here, he is in the West Coast. Not a surprise, right? He's here one day and then he's over there another day. He's actually uh, speaking at a revival in Seattle. So um, please pray for him. He will be also spending some time with his dad after the revival. Uh, so please pray that it would be a quality time with his dad. Um, and that the revival itself would be uh, God's revelation of his will and people coming before him with joy. Um, And uh, I would also like to say hi to the college uh, people who joined us uh, today. Um, It seems like uh, summer break is around the time. I'm looking forward to seeing more of our CSL members to join us. All right. Um, life in the wilderness, life in the wilderness, it is not an ordinary life, as you can tell. I have never experienced uh, life in the wilderness, something like what we see in the book of Numbers. Um, I guess the closest that I got to was, um, you know, being at Death Valley um, during summertime, but that was pretty much it. Um, but I think the, the setting in the wilderness is what actually helps uh, us to see what is important. What is the life and death matter and what is not? So um, I used to um, enjoy hiking when I was uh, in college and um, uh, I had a chance to 
um, visit uh, Mount, it's called Jiri Mountain, Mount Jiri in Korea. And um, we started uh, our hiking with uh, a lot of uh, enthusiasm. We were carrying tents and we were carrying uh, a lot of things that were necessary for our camping. And uh, we were on our way up to our destination. We were talking about this and that, what we're going to cook when we arrive, uh, what the place is going to look like, all these things. Um, but there was a turnaround as we were uh, keep hiking. Uh, the clouds started to gather around um, that area, and um, it was obvious that um, it's getting dark, and it started to rain a bit, and I, we were nowhere close to the destination. So what immediately happened was um, we started with a lot of chattings as we were hiking, but then all of a sudden, conversation just disappeared. Because both of us understood the situation. We both knew that um, if we don't make it to the destination within an hour, we're probably going to get lost. There weren't many people hiking uh, in that area, and it was very likely that we would be in a very dangerous situation. So from then on, both of us, without any conversation, we started to, with full energy, just hiking, walking, and trying to get to the destination. Thank God we arrived at the destination before it got too dark, and that's why I'm here now. <laughs> but uh, um, that experience has actually taught me um, when things become clear, what is the life and death matter? Everything else just disappears. And I guess the wilderness experience that these Israelites were going through was a time that God is, God is teaching what is the life and death matter and what is not. Especially us, to us, who are distracted by so many things in this world. This uh, time that we're spending concentrating on the book of Numbers, I hope it is a time that would lead you to see what is the real matter in my life and what I should be putting all my efforts and time into. What are the really important things in my life? So let me just briefly summarize the previous chapter. Uh, what you see, what you saw in chapter 20 was not pretty. Um, the experience uh, these Israelites were having during this period was, you know, overall pretty um, rough, right? The, the two prominent leaders, Miriam and Aaron passed away, and that was kind of signaling that the new era has arrived. The new generation who will be entering the promised land, they are to rise to the fore. And then comes the unfortunate incident that we read through last week, last Sunday. People started to quarrel, and they were quarreling against Moses and God due to the lack of water. And Moses you know, immediately, as he always does, intercedes. He bows down before the Lord and was, uh, he was asking, um, you know, he was asked by, um, he was asked to speak to the rock by God. And what God was commanding was to speak to the rock so that he would bring water. Sadly, what started with a glory, uh, what started with a godly anger, uh, all of a sudden just turned into a performance of Moses himself uh, his ungodliness, his yearning desire to be at the center of all these things, uh, which led him to speak harshly to the people, calling them rebels, and hit the rock twice with a staff, as if he is the one who is bringing the water. And as a result, Moses was banned from entering the promised land, and then guess what? After all that drama... When they tried to resume their journey towards Canaan, uh, out of all countries, their very brother nation, Edom, the nation of Esau, would not let them pass through their territory. What a gloomy passage, right? Nothing, nothing seems to be coming together for the Israelites. Now, thankfully, things start to take a turn from chapter 21. 
from the beginning of our passage today, Israel starts winning battles. When Israel was coming by the way of Atharim, Arad, the, the Canaanites living in the Negev, they attacked them and they even took captive of some of the Israelites. Israel does not step back this time. This time they vow to the Lord as we see in verse 2 and defeat. They actually defeat these Canaanites, destroying their cities, including the city of Hormah. Now, if you remember uh, this city, Horma, from chapter 14, uh, does it ring a bell? It was the very place uh, they were. These Israelites were defeated by the Canaanites because they went into the battle without the approval of God. Moses actually told them not to go because the Lord is not going to be among them. They were going against the will of God, but they still stubbornly went. And they got demolished. That was Horma. This time, they have the full approval from God and see how the attitude of the Israelites have changed. They ask and they vow before God before they actually take action. What a dramatic turnaround. It looks like the, the, the Israel of chapter 20 is a totally different Israel from what we see in chapter 21 today. And check, what, uh, check out the passage that follows uh, today's passage in chapter 21. We hear more about more victories. Uh, the Israelites, you know, not only they defeat the Amorites in verse 21 to 30, but um, they also defeat uh, Bashan in the following paragraph, the last paragraph of today's uh, chapter. So things have changed drastically and Israel seems to be on the roll at least at least until you read from verse 4 a segment of today's passage so after the sweet victory against Arad Israel prepares themselves for another departure towards the promised land but if you carefully read what happens in verse 4 Israel is not heading towards the land of Canaan at least Direction-wise, Mount Hor is actually way down, way down south from Canaan. So Israelites should be heading north if they want to go to Canaan, right? However, it says in our passage from the very beginning, it says they set out by the way to the Red Sea, which is southward, meaning they're heading towards the opposite direction. Why? Because they have to go all the way around the land of Edom. This is where they start getting impatient. Imagine you've been journeying or detouring in the, in the wilderness for 40 years. Not 40 days, not 40 months, 40 years. And you realize you are heading for another another detour in this wilderness. Man, that's like, you know, for sure, a nerve-wracking experience, right? Especially to you and to me, I guess, you know, growing up in this efficiency-driven world, having this efficiency-oriented mind. This is what drives us nuts, right? But you know what? If you actually take some time to think about your own life, it is not difficult to realize God is not efficiency-driven. I mean, haven't we all experienced it? Wondering, why? Why would God do this or do that when it was... Why, why didn't he do this or why didn't he do that when it was the perfect timing? It was time for God to take action at that moment in my life and it just didn't happen. At the right moment, God did not. Respond. We experience this even when we are trying to do something for God's glory, right? Maybe you've been praying for years, asking God to give faith to your spouse or maybe your parents or your kids, your best friend. But even after five years, 10 years, 20 years, nothing happens. 
and you are wondering, why? Why? If God is the God that I know, if he wants to be efficient, it has to happen now. But it doesn't. Now, some of you may be, you may have been asking God for your whole lifetime for a healing of some, some illness, deadly illness, or a broken relationship that you are struggling with, and yet that suffering continues. When Moses thought he was ready to save his people out of the hands of, from the hands of Pharaoh, from the land of slavery, Egypt, God intentionally made him detour for 40 more years. 40 more years in the wilderness. And guess what? Moses wasn't even doing something, you know, um, that seems important. You know, he wasn't going through a specialized boot camp over that period in the wilderness to be prepared as a leader. No. All that he did was just shepherding, shepherding the sheep in the wilderness for 40 years. 40 years. What a waste of time. 40 years in the wilderness. Friends, this is when we must confess. And as we have sung in our first praise song today, you know, God's thought, God's thoughts are not our thoughts. We never fully fathom what God's will is and what his thoughts is. We never fully understand. We never see the full picture of God's way of working in our lives. He will at times intentionally lead you and me into unexpected paths that may seem awfully inefficient in our eyes. And don't be surprised if you at times feel very on edge about this. It's because we don't have the full picture that God has. This is how we learn as people of God who God is and how he works in our lives. And isn't this one of the major reasons if, if you are ever praying? Isn't this one of the reasons why you come to your knees to pray? We pour out our impatient feelings before God because it can be at times quite frustrating because we don't see the full picture. David rightly cries out to God in Psalm 13, How long, O Lord? How long? Because what seems to be the right timing, what seems to be the right things that should happen, according to David's thought, wasn't happening at all. And impatience was driving him crazy. If you are one of those who have been uh, nervous or anxious or even frustrated about what is going on in your life, the scripture encourages us to just come to the Lord with all that is in us with that very frustration, with that very anxiety, with that impatience, just come before the Lord. And even if you don't get immediate answers, the scripture teaches us to still continue to spend that time with the Lord in prayers. If you need help doing so, there's a great way to do it. Uh, you can join our bi-weekly prayer Wednesday and let us, let your brothers and sisters pray with you. And as David has experienced in Psalm 13, I believe that as you continue to stay in that prayer, as you continue to come before the Lord with all that is in you, you will somehow find that one day your cry, how long, O Lord, will be turning into praise to the Father because that is what happens in Psalm 13. David cries out to the Lord, beginning with an anxiety, with that impatience, but at the end, he 
He was praising the Lord, even though he did not understand what was going on in full scope. Now, the problem in our passage is the Israelites went on a different route with their impatience. Instead of pouring out their hearts to God, they let that impatience latch onto their old self, which is what we talked about last week. It ignited a flame in their sinfulness, deeply rooted in their hearts. And in verse 5, they start speaking against God and against Moses. And from here on, you see what you've been seeing chapters after chapters throughout the book of Numbers. The same kind of routine. They start complaining again. Why have you? Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? See what's going on? They are now assuming they are going to die. They say, why do you let us die in this wilderness? They are assuming they are for sure going to die, which is a blunt denial or mistrust of God's power to save them. Their hearts are now so hardened that they are telling God, your plan of bringing us out of Egypt, your plan of saving us, your plan, your plan of leading us into the promised land has failed. They are canceling the whole plan of salvation, and by doing so, they are canceling God of who he is. And pay attention to what they say at the end of verse 5 because it, it just reveals. It, it just brings everything out. The raw sinfulness that is completely taking control of them. It's not even logical. You know, at first they say, there's no food, there's no water. And then they turn around and say, we loathe this worthless food. So there was actually food, but they didn't want it. They were referring to the bread from heaven. Manna. I understand that people can get tired if they are having the same food every single meal, but we have already read in Numbers 11, there were so many ways you could cook and prepare this manna. Um, you could ground it in hand mills or beat it in, in mortars, and you could boil it in pots and there were so many ways you could cook. And I would understand if, if the manna really tasted awful, but the truth is, according to scripture, it tasted pretty good. It says it tasted like cake baked with oil. So I'm, I'm thinking about um, Korean dog at this moment. I'm, I'm not sure if I'm right. But, uh, and in Exodus 16, it says it tasted like wafers made with oil. Honey, how can a wafer made with honey taste bad? No. So God has been providing this extraordinary food abundantly day in and day out of their lives, and they still complain. Now this probably means there is something else, something else going on, something else going on behind the scene. See how they describe manna in verse 5. They call the food worthless or miserable food. And they said they loathed, they hated, they abhorred this worthless and miserable food. You need to understand what is underlying here. If someone uses such term to describe what you have cooked, and I hope this never happens to you because it's going to be pretty heartbreaking, um, that person is no longer talking about your food. That person is actually talking about you. He is getting personal. The problem with the Israelite here is no longer the food. The problem is God. They have put on their ugly old self, and they are fully displaying it at this moment. It is an astonishing reminder to all of us that even when, even when you are receiving the very providence of God daily, we can go against the provider, God. 
And this is the ugly side of all of us. And this is what we struggle with as Christians. And God could not let his people be devoured by this horrible sinfulness, this ugly face. He could not let them be drowned in it. He had to deal with it. He had to make a righteous judgment upon them. So he decides to dis discipline them. In verse 6, he sends fiery serpents among these people and let them be bitten to death by their venom. You know, the adjective fiery uh, probably describes the effect of its venom, it, which was lethal. Once you get bit, uh, you are in serious danger. Some of you may be thinking, why fiery serpents? And Lawrence of Arabia, if you understand whom I'm talking about, you're probably part of the old, old, older upper generation. Um, Lawrence of Arabia, who travel around this area um, that, that, that we're seeing in the book of Numbers in the late 90s, 19th century, uh, once wrote in his book calling this area a snake-devoted land. And he shares in his book that um, he encountered numerous hooded vipers, cobras, and black snakes, and, and he mentions Everyone, even the mightiest soldiers, you know, um, they were afraid of this. Everyone feared to walk at night because these snakes were all over the ground. It makes perfect sense that God would use the snakes in the wilderness already there to chasten the Israelites who were drowning in their sins. So, what do, we, what do we actually make out of this, this incident? Paul, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 9 to 13, he mentions this discipline of God, and he says, We must not put Christ to test, as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents. You see this? Paul knew this book of Numbers. He knew this chapter. And he talks about it. And then he says, Now these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed, lest he fall. Brothers and sisters, today's passage was written down by God with his intention of instructing you and me. Yes, it was for the people during those days too, but it was for us. It is for us. This passage is for you and for me. And none of us are exceptional. We are all prone to put our Lord to the test by taking the matter of sin casually. Lightly. Isn't this the culture that we're living in? Kind of minimizing what sin is. Kind of saying, it is okay to live as we sin. Because everyone's doing it. Now some of us may think God went too far with his punishment in our passage. Was it necessary to kill his own people with fire serpents? I think this comes from the lack of our understanding of God's own character. Yes, God is a loving and merciful God, but at the same time, He is righteous. No wonder Romans chapter 1, verse 18 tells us that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness, all unrighteousness of men. Which means there is no such thing as excusable sin. When it comes to sin, there is nothing casual. Anything, anything that is against God's holiness is under the wrath of God. And there is a reason why Jesus, at his first encounter with the paralytic, doesn't even say a word about his paralysis. Instead, Jesus from his mouth, the first thing that came out was, Son, your sins 
are forgiven. Paralysis is not a life and death matter, but sin is. If any of you have been thinking, why are the pastors at Jubilee always, every single week, preaching something about sin? Now, can we just skip a couple of months without this? Can we just take it easy and not hear about it? Here's the answer. Because it is your, it is my, it is our life and death matter. The Bible does not stop reminding us and warning us about it. And therefore, we all need to hear it from the pulpit. And whenever God gives seemingly cruel judgment resulting in death, I think it is a clear warning for us to take this sin issue seriously and treat it as your life and death issue. So how are we taking this issue? How are we taking this matter of sin in our daily lives? Are we confessing our sins to one another and praying for one another about it? Are we? When we gather for fellowship, when we have our CG meetings, are we sharing about our struggles with sin and praying for one another? Do we talk about the matter of sin with our kids? Or is it always kind of pushed back on the priority list filled with topics like grades, SAT scores, sports career, marriage, and etc. But nothing about sin. Not that these are unimportant, don't get me wrong, but if you have never, if you have never even once brought up, talked, or taught anything about this to your child, or with your spouse, if you have never shared this matter, or with your brothers and sisters in Christ, if you have never done this, today is the day to start. Remember, God, if he wills, if he wills, he can still send fiery serpent to sinners who test him. And the only reason, the only reason it's not happening to us is because he is patient. It's because he is slow to anger. But don't forget it. When Jesus comes again as our ultimate king and judge, he will eventually execute his final judgment that is even not comparable to what we see in our passage today. This fiery Serpent is nothing comparing to what is to come when Christ comes as our king again. Now, thankfully, thankfully, our God is not only righteous and holy, but he is also the God of hesed love, meaning he is the God who gives a promise through his covenant and he loves us according to what he has spoken to us. He is merciful. He is slow to anger. He is love himself. When the Israelites were dying due to these fiery serpents, they came to Moses and they actually repented. That's surprising, right? It was always Moses interceding in the midst of their quarreling and never them first repenting. But here... By the work of the Holy Spirit, they start repenting their sins, and they actually ask Moses to intercede for them. So Moses prayed, and God commands Moses in verse 8 to make fiery serpent and set it on a pole so, so that everyone who is bitten by the fiery serpent, as he or she sees it, may live. You know, I've always thought it is such a strange idea such a strange idea to make an image of a serpent on the pole as a cure. I mean, you see this image uh, on the ambulance uh, vehicle, and uh, it's not even pretty, right? And the serpent image itself, it, it, it is terrifying. And even more terrifying 
if you are the one who is bitten by the serpent and now asked to gaze upon the bronze snake. The very snake that you were bitten by and you are threatened of your life, now you are looking at the image of that snake. That's very weird. But surprisingly, the bronze serpent that should be the symbol of death now gives life to the people as they are facing it, as they are encountering the bronze serpent, as they were struggling through the life and death situation. This sort of symbol of death becomes a hope of life. Everyone who is poisoned by the deadly venom, all he needs to do at this moment in order to live is to look. It's that simple. It's, it's just to look at the bronze serpent and he will live. What is even stranger than this bronze serpent is the cross of Jesus Christ. The cross was supposed to be a symbol of curse. As Galatians 3.13 says, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. For this cross to make sense to all of us, sinners like you and me, it should be us who actually commit sin that should be crucified on that cross, right? However, However, on that very cross, which is the symbol of death and curse, hung the Son of God, who knew no sin, but became sin, so that in him we might become God's righteousness. Christ himself became our substitutionary atonement by bearing our sins in his body on the tree so that we may die to sin and live to righteousness. And whoever is bitten by deadly sin, all that he needs to do, all that she needs to do is to look at Jesus and believe in him. And the life to give, and, and the life given to him as a result is not just a, a temporary life. It is an eternal life that the Lord grants you as you are gazing upon that very cross of Christ Jesus. The life, the sinner who once was sinner will rejoice in forever in the presence of Christ himself. For Jesus says in John chapter 3, verse 14 to 15, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. I know that some of you in this room have never received Jesus as your Savior. And here's the calling that comes from Jesus himself. Behold Jesus. Look upon Christ. Yes, it is that simple. Look to Jesus and believe in him, and you will live. Your gut instinct, as soon as you hear this, as a sinner bitten by sin, is going to be, you know, you're, you're going to want to look more deeply into your own sin. You are going to want to look into your wounds more rather than the cross. Or you might be wanting, desiring to look at something else, totally random, instead of looking at the cross. And this is what the Lord teaches us. Whatever you are gazing upon as a way to live in this life, if it is not Christ Jesus, none of those things are going to work. Whether it be your career, whether it be your job, whether it be your family, whether it be 
something that you would consider as part of your faith life, if that is not coming out of your Christ-centered worldview, if that is not coming out of the reaction for looking upon Christ Jesus' cross, that is never going to save you. It can never do anything for you in terms of your salvation. But let me tell you this. No matter how much time you spend indulging yourself in therapies or psychological analyzing of your own sin, again, this is not going to cure your sin issue. For your salvation from sin cannot come from yourself, cannot come from your own effort. You are a sinner, as I am, as we all are, and salvation cannot come from the one who sins. You will never find life in any of these things for this purpose of giving you life. Remember that God has sent Christ Jesus, the Son of God, who came into this world being humble as God and man. For it says in John 3.16, For God so loved the world, for God so loved the world, he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. A life glorifying Christ and rejoicing in him forever is what eternal life means. And you know, Nicodemus once was someone who did not take this life and death matter uh, of sin seriously. He had no idea what it meant to be on this narrow path. As a well-established elite Pharisee, he probably believed in his own righteousness, his own life and his, de his deeds. He thought he was living a good life, a good life, probably much better than most of us here. And he put a lot of time and effort in building up his career, being a good Pharisee. But when he met Jesus, what happened? His whole universe was shaken, shattered. He realized nothing was more worthy than Christ. And as a result, in John chapter 19, when Jesus was hanged on the cross, when he died on that spot to save us, Nicodemus, he was the one who risked his life to bind Jesus' body in linen cloths and with spice. Even, even though he could be found and could be caught, arrested as a Christian and be sentenced to death, he was willing to do so because he found what really matters in his life. If you are already a believer, remember the life that God has called you into. It is a life continuing to look upon Jesus until you meet him face to face when he comes again. Your faith, which is the gift of God, is not merely an entrance ticket into God's kingdom. No, it is your way of living. Looking upon Jesus is your way of living as Christians in this world. It is the way of your living as kingdom citizens in this world. And by that very faith, righteous believers shall live. Meaning, by faith you live a life dying to sin and living to Christ as his righteous children. You live a life that is worthy of the gospel only when you acknowledge what is the true matter, what is the significant thing in your life 
by gazing upon the cross of Christ Jesus. And I pray and I hope that this coming week would be a time that you fully draw yourself before the Lord, asking that that cross of Christ Jesus would never leave before your vision, that your gaze would be always upon it, that whatever you do, it would be a result of your encountering with him. It would be a result of your obedience to Christ himself. Let's all pray.